So this is going to be a little bit more of an informal process. I have Philip Lundgren here, who is an engine programmer. He's well known in the community, and myself is Colin Bishop. And what we're going to do is we're going to go over some of the programming aspects of CryEngine, since we've covered a lot of the creation of assets and how you interface with them in the editor. But for years now, the community has wanted more of a programming background and tutorials. So what we're going to do is use this as a Q&A, and we're going to get to it. But first, Philip, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. So I'm Philip, and I work on the engine team at Crytek. So I work on core, and I work on basically everything relating to CryEngine, right? to improve systems and improve the user experience overall. So, so to start, we're going to go through the flow of downloading CryEngine and compiling it using Visual Studio. We don't have any prerequisites. We just assume that you have a working computer and an internet connection. Cool, cool. So this is GitHub right here. And uh, how long have we been on this since? Wow, since the 5.2 release, right? So about 5.2. And I think we're going to stick with it for a while. But uh, I guess this is, the, this is strictly the engine, correct? Or there's some uh, game code? This is strictly actually... the engine. So there is actually some some game code in here, a like game SDK, a game sample that we're going to remove eventually, uh, the game templates that you can see in the CryEngine launcher, and also game zero. But beyond that, this is purely engine, and no actual assets are stored here. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, I guess we can get into it. So what's the first step that we have to do? So the first step is, of course, to navigate to this site. You can see the URL here in the address bar. And then we're going to make sure to clone the repository in GitHub desktop. So yeah, we have to clone it and we have to have GitHub. If they don't have GitHub, where do they go? Is it directly in here? Is there something yeah. on GitHub? It is available on GitHub. So actually, if you click the button and you don't have it installed, it will guide you how to install it. But you can also just go GitHub desktop on Google. Okay. And you got it. simply download and install. Perfect. Okay. Got so. Now to make sure, you actually have to be logged in on github.com as well as in the GitHub client. Assuming we are that, we can simply say open in desktop. Perfect. And getting back to the login, does it cost anything to make an account? Nope, it's totally free. Totally free, gotcha. So now we already had a repository here. So what we'll do is we'll simply remove this. Okay. And nuke it quickly. There you go. Now open in desktop. And it will ask you, where do you want to save it? And we simply choose this get directory we have on the desktop. Now it's going to clone that to the folder, which I have right here. I'll move it here to be more clear. So once this, this is done, all the files you can see here on the web, all the entire CryEngine source code, you can see here. Okay. So we'll probably pause this and just wait, and then we'll come back and see it when it's completely cloned, because it takes a couple minutes. So I guess this is exactly what it looks like when it's done cloning. And then what do we, what do, we do next? So you can see all the changes here popping up. Uh, what we should explain to you guys is how we branch. What we'll see right here is that we checked out the release branch, which is the default. This always represents the latest CryEngine, the latest stable version of CryEngine, that is. So when we released 5.2.3, we directly updated the release stream. So anyone cloning from Git gets the 5.2 release right away. Then if you also release something new, we can simply press sync and you get that right away. And what we have are three streams then, or branches. Uh, release, which I mentioned just now. Stabilization, which is what we use when we are preparing a release for release. Uh, and then main, which is where we do the vast majority of development. Whenever we're doing new features, we merge them directly into main. And when we're ready for a release, we start stabilizing inside of stabilization and eventually push the release to the release stream and notify everyone through social media, crying.com and so on. So can users actually uh, build main and use that and get technically features before, or is it It is that's possible, but there are some potential issues that we're looking into. The biggest problem is that we're actually providing SDKs with releases that you can see here. 
Mm -hmm. So for 523, you actually have SDKs tied to them. For example, if you scroll down here, there you have the 520 SDKs. Gotcha. The problem then is that if we update an SDK during development, we won't automatically upload it. So you will actually have to find that yourself and download it. In the future, we might improve this mm -hmm. in order to allow people to work directly off development, but it's a bit shaky still. Okay. However, everything that's on the release stream is provided to you right away. Gotcha. So if we ignore these pages now, we can go into the actual repository that was cloned. Mm -hmm. So looking at Explorer, we should have everything that is available on the GitHub interface. And to start, we'll run the CryWAF executable. This is a system that allows for building the engine and automatically downloading the SDKs of GitHub. Do you by any chance know what WAF <coughs> stands for? I've always wondered this. Oh, wow. No, I don't know. No, you don't know. No, no, it's I'm a sorry. random question. I guess it's, yeah, it's just WAF. It might actually just be WAF. Okay. Uh, it's a very good question, though. I want to find out now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so okay. carry on. Yeah, so we simply run this executable and choose what we want to build. In this case, I'll say we just want to build a game zero project. Okay. We don't want the bigger game SDK project. That's basically a full game that's provided as is. However, it's very hard to develop things with. So we'll just go with game zero, which is a minimal game with no actual logic inside it. And as you can see, it will automatically download the latest SDKs for the 5.2 release right away. Ah, so that, that's actually downloading through WAF mm -hmm. the external SDKs. That's pretty nice. Yeah, that's awesome. That works. And is it down, where does it download those from? Do you know? It downloads straight from GitHub. So, so it if takes you them switch from back to releases here on github.com. So it goes, yeah, it goes to that exactly. exact point. And you see the 5.2.0 release with the SDKs here. And it simply uses that URL. OK. If you wanted to, you could get the SDKs here or simply use the automatic flow. All right, I guess we'll wait until it's complete and then we'll come back. Yep. So now that we have WAF, it's created everything. Maybe, so what is all of the stuff that's printed out inside so of this? When WAF runs, it just tells you pretty much what it's doing. So if we expand this window quickly and scroll up, we can see that it's, yeah, that's all we can see. <laughs> it's a lot of blue. <laughs> <laughs> Initially, it was just generating Uber faults. Okay. which is pretty much taking a bunch of source files and compiling them as one. This is an optimization to make the engine compile a bit faster. Uh, but we can ignore that. As you see here, after it's done with all the blue stuff, it says generate Uber files finished successfully, which is great. Okay. Uh, beyond that, it's just notifying you of what happened, what it couldn't find, and so on. For example, if you can't find certain SDKs, it will just disable that feature mm -hmm. for now, which is good. OK. So if we switch back and minimize this quickly, uh, to the window you see here. This is the UI that WAF pops up whenever it's ready, which allows you to generate the Uber files again, which is what we saw here. Generate the solution, which is what we'll use to open well, the code in Visual Studio and browse the source code. And then configure and uh, view the options is something we can look into a bit later. But for now, we'll focus on simply generating the Visual Studio solution. This actually happened automatically, but if you do make any changes in the future, just make sure that you hit Visual Studio Solution and it will automatically regenerate this for you. And then simply go into the solutions directory and there you go, you have your solution file ready to go. Yes. And this is a professional version. What's the version that uh, they provide for free? Is it community? I exactly. Believe? Visual yes. Studio Community. Uh, so you can just download that for free. I believe if we just try a quick Google search, right? so Visual Studio Community, and yep, just the top result, and then you can download Visual Studio right here and install it. So it's totally free, and it allows for building CryEngine. Mm -hmm. No hassle. Cool. And, and as soon as Visual Studio is ready and finished launching, we can investigate the source code. Takes a little while. Yeah. Ah, super quick. Here we go. Okay. okay. So now we have the Visual Studio window here with the default settings. We can see all the projects that CryEngine uses right here. Ooh, it's a lot. Yeah, there's a lot. So all of this is the engine. Just various modules allowing for C sharp support from Crime on a Bridge, uh, the entity system, animation, and so on. Uh, if we scroll down, we also see the Windows Launcher, 
which is the executable you use to actually launch the various systems. The various systems inside of CryEngine or? Exactly. So this is the entry point. Whenever we have compiled, we'll see the Windows launcher executable. I don't remember the name. It might be game.exe. Yeah, uh, I think it's been yeah, the game.exe. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Or gamesdk.exe. And that's compiled from this binary, uh, this project, sorry. And in it, then after you launch it, it will load all these modules. It will start with Quest system and then load the renderer and keep going until it has the entire engine loaded. So why is Cry 3D Engine uh, in bold starting out? Is there any reason behind that? Or is yeah, that's actually the starter project. So whenever we're done compiling and press F5 or simply say debug, say start debugging here, it will load a default project. Now this is actually incorrect by default. What we want to do is right click the Windows launcher, which as before I said is the entry point, and then simply say set as starter project. And then that's bold. And when we're done compiling and press F5 or Control Shift B, depending on your settings, or simply clicking on the local Windows debugger button here, it will la launch the engine automatically. Okay. Which is pretty handy. And here at the bottom, we also see the Crygame Zero project, which we selected earlier on. If you selected Game SDK, you would see that here. Or if you selected both, you would also see both projects. Here. And that's strictly game code. Exactly. That is this. only C++ game code. OK. Cool. cool. So we can also look up here to see some configuration settings. Uh, what we have are these four options being debug, something that we sometimes use internally when trying to find a, or to find bug. Uh, we don't really recommend using this in production at all or when you develop. Simply ignore it and try to go for profile or release. What performance is, is essentially an almost sh shippable build, but with some debug information in included to allow you to see what's going wrong. Profile is what we use primarily internally. This is a build that's similar to performance in a bit, but it allows for profiling a lot of systems, includes some extra information, and in general, it's just meant for the development. Okay. And finally, release. Whenever you're actually ready to try your game for real and give it to testers, consumers, uh, or anything that's considered release or shipping, you use this release configuration. And what's unique about release compared to everything else? Does it strip out something and make it strips out a bunch of the de development and debugging information? So for example, you can do profiling in normal builds and see, okay, my game is running at 50 FPS, but I want to get it a bit higher. Uh, in release builds, we strip that out entirely. You won't be able to see which systems are slow and why. Instead, everything will be just run as fast as it can because it, only the systems required for release are available. Okay. Uh, you also don't get as much debugging information. So if you get a crash, it might be harder to diagnose and release due to more optimizations. But for now, we'll just select profile here. And on the side, you can also choose, do I want to build for 32-bit? If the user only has a 32-bit uh, processor that is not capable of 64-bit or an operating system that only supports 32-bit. But for now, since we're on a 64-bit machine, as most people are, uh, we'll just build 64-bit. Okay. And all we have to do then is right-click here and say Build Solution. Once we've done this, it will start building the entire engine. And depending on the speed of your machine, maybe 20 minutes, 